Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Simon Thurley. I'm the Provost of Gresham College, and I'd like to welcome you uh, here to this evening's lecture, which is part of a, a decade-long collaboration that Gresham College has had with the Fulbright Commission. The Fulbright Commission uh, exists to foster cultural understanding through educational exchange, and we here at Gresham College have been given free public uh, lectures since 1597. Our um, lecture this evening is uh, given by Tara Wheeler. Uh, she's a cyber security fellow at Harvard University Kennedy School Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. She's also uh, an international security fellow at New America, a Washington-based policy think tank. She's a US-UK Fulbright Scholar in cybersecurity. She's also served as an informational security technical subject matter expert for the European Union, the Washington Post, the US Federal Trade Commission, NPR, PBS, Nova, Oxford, Stanford, the OECD, and many more. She's the author of Women in Tech, Take Your Career to the Next Level with Practical Advice and Inspiring Stories published in 2016. She's an Electronic Frontier Foundation Advisory Board member, an inaugural contributing cybersecurity expert for the Washington Post, and a foreign policy contributor on cyber warfare. Today, she will be speaking to us on cyber war crimes. Please join me in welcoming Tara Wheeler. Thank you. I am beyond overwhelmed at the kind introduction. Thank you so much, Simon. And it's an honor to be here with you all today to speak on the topic of cyber war crimes. Thank you especially to the US-UK Fulbright Commission and to all of you listening today. Let's get started. The kind and incredibly generous introduction aside, it takes some kind of strange people to end up having conversations about cyber warfare for a living and let's not say for fun. I have spent my time learning to do a range of both risky and interesting behaviors like poker, flying planes, learning how to uh, ride a motorcycle in the middle of a pandemic. To be fair, I think all of us picked up a couple of strange hobbies over the last year or so. And yet the nature of what keeps happening in the headlines keeps pulling us back again and again in front of our computers. We see on an everyday basis that there is the rumblings of something beginning to happen, something dangerous and different. And I think the UK has stepped out really in front of the curve when it comes to the nature of cyber warfare in explicitly declaring the nature of the National Cyber Force. I've had a conversation with some of the people involved in this process and in this project, and the United Kingdom is fortunate to have some of the most dedicated, brilliant, kind, let me repeat, brilliant cyber professionals that are known in the world. And it's an honor to get the chance to meet with them during this, this process. And as we see these headlines and we see the increasing nature of the threats that are building and bubbling on the internet and starting to merge into what we isn't we, we can't even really call it real life anymore. This is real life. This is where we're sitting. You're sitting right now watching me in front of a computer, probably, right? And that makes this experience as real for me and for you as it is for anyone trying to have a communication or have a conversation with anyone on the internet. And as real as anyone beginning to enter a power grid or a water supply station or a hospital. The way we think about these headlines, the way we think about the kinds of cyber attacks that we know are beginning, have been carried out, are ongoing now, they don't have a framework. They don't have a way that we think about them in terms of other things for severity. We can't place them in the world on a lot of levels because it's still so hard to think of so much of this as real, right? The reason I'm in the United Kingdom right now and uh, and here at the incredibly kind invitation of the US-UK Fulbright Commission is to explore what happened during WannaCry in 2017 here at the National Health Service. The NHS dealt with what is 
without any hesitation, the most devastating potential and actual harm to human beings that have been conducted so far in a cyber attack. And the fact that it's a nation state cyber attack makes it an act of war. We're gonna go through more of what that means over the course of this conversation. But I think I can begin now and in this conversation with you, start to answer the questions, not just what is an act of cyber war, but when is someone actually going to die from all this? I know I remember the first time I started to think to myself, the act of sitting down at my computer every day has started to become an act of violence, an act of prevention, an act of defense or offense. And I think when that realization starts to hit home, we start to go from someone who's a cybersecurity professional, from someone who's in IT to someone who thinks about the larger system, not just the computer sitting in front of me. I'm looking at a lot of screens right now, and they've started to mean something different to me over the course of the last several years, as I look more and more into the nature of conflict, especially over the internet. This is a world where people are trying to wreck my day and yours every day in a new and interesting and horrifying way. But there are ways to make it better. There are ways to keep yourself safe. There's ways to understand what's happening. And I'm gonna start going into those now. So to start this conversation, this framework of how we begin to think about cyber warfare, let's start by looking at the nature of war itself, how it's developed over time, and where this even fits in the concept of what would constitute warfare. We started a long time ago hitting each other over the head with rocks. And as war started to really develop, the concept of the dimensionality of warfare evolved right alongside it. Whether you're talking about the Battle of Salamis or any of the heroic engagements of the, of the past on land, we're often talking about a unidimensional situation where you can see your opponent, attack them, go back and forth, and there's a single dimension of warfare. If we want to add that second dimension of warfare and ask ourselves, what would, be, what would it be like, not just to fight along a straight line, but to fight on a plane we might move from the Battle of Salamis to something a little bit more like the Battle of Actium or Trafalgar. We might move to the water. All of a sudden, we could conceive of the notion of expanding the dimensionality of warfare from a straight line to a plane, where the amount of distance between you and your opponent started to decrease as the ability and speed of the vessels and transportation as part of warfare increased. So, this is a once upon a, a, a time story, right? Once upon a time, we were limited to land war. Then we were able to fight on water. Well, now if your opponent gets that navy, they can make war upon you from a further distance as well as in another dimension. And what happens when all of a sudden we add a third dimension into the concept of warfare? We begin to add the Battle of Britain, we add in uh, the, the idea that you could, instead of fighting in two dimensions, start adding that third dimension. And all of a sudden, not just the space of warfare increases, but the friction points to reaching your opponent decrease again. All of a sudden, having a mountain range in the way of you and your enemy doesn't necessarily stop you from going to war. So adding this third dimension into the concept of warfare got us uh, right up until about you know, 1945, 46. And then we started to ask our, ourselves, what if we added an additional dimension of space? And that concept of spatial warfare took us from Salamis to Trafalgar to uh, the Battle of Britain. And all of a sudden here we are in missile defense and Star Wars and the space race with space, with this, this additional dimension, we've added the rotation of the Earth's orbit into the way that we go to war. That's that additional dimension for space. And with that, the other belligerent in the conflict with you might become too, too vast, too directioned around the globe to really engage with as meaningfully anymore, right? And yet, we now find ourselves adding an additional dimension of warfare where not only is your opponent potentially too far away or too unreachable, like in space, they might become 
unknowable. The concept of cyber warfare is one in which you're not necessarily always 100% sure who you're fighting. That dimension has always been there a little bit in warfare, from simply the concept of asking yourself whether or not you know your enemy. Knowing your enemy and winning 100 battles thereafter, as Sun Tzu said, is a part of, of military philosophy for millennia. And there's always been that question of whether we know our opponents. But I think we've always mostly thought about it in terms of the mind as opposed to whether or not we can actually correctly identify them. Guerrilla warfare and the evolution of bringing more and more people into additional conflicts has started to elide the concept of this perfect vision of a uniformed enemy combatant on the field of battle that you can clearly identify who's following a set of rules, is going to abide by the Geneva Conventions. And we now find ourselves in this world where the other belligerent has become a form of unknowable that, that we struggle to encapsulate because all of the ways that we've conceived of warfare involves first knowing who your enemy is before beginning to predict their actions or their motivations. And that concept of becoming more familiar, more comfortable with predicting the actions and likely motives of an enemy without ever having identified them first is a real challenge in our new conceptions and new doctrines of warfare. This is how we're ending up at a place where we're not sure who we're going to war with, but we might actually be getting better at the idea of going to war to begin with. So after we have this conversation about the increasing dimensionality of warfare, after we think about how it is that, that we can conceive of an opponent, then we need to ask ourselves not just who an enemy is in cyber warfare, but whether or not we're actually at war with someone. So what is legally cyber war? Well, in the United States, there is a bright line, a clear definition of what constitutes cyber war. In the small windowless rooms where people conduct this, the, these kinds of operations, um, in the United States, it's very common to have a small group of people who are writing scripts, executing them, and engaging in Title 50 espionage. Flatly, countries around the world engage in espionage, and there are two codes of law in the United States, Title 50 and Title 10, that govern espionage and warfare. In the United States, legally, for as long as you are merely listening and not engaging in destruction and deception on foreign shores, you are engaged under Title 50, the laws of espionage and what are legally allowed to be done when listening in on an opponent. The second that someone hits an enter key, the second that the electromagnetic impulse from someone striking an enter key that executes a script that changes something on a server in a foreign country that either in, uh, destroys information or changes the way people would behave or um, engages in shutting down a plant or any of the, the, the ways that you can conduct cyber warfare by attacking, especially industrial control systems, you have stepped in that moment from Title 50 to Title 10 in the United States, that has now become legally an act of cyber war. These moments, the moment when you hit that enter key have become so important that at this point, I, I am given to understand by people who would know that they require the same kind of sign off from the Judge Advo Advocate General Corps in the United States and the same kind of sign-offs on a forward action that an act of kinetic warfare would. That means that hitting a single key in the United States that moves you from Title 50 to Title 10 is an act of war and it is treated with that gravity. I fear on occasion that many of the kinds of people that, that engage in cyber warfare in rogue nation states around the world revel in the lack of definition because cyber war is often very difficult to define. And that clarity of definition in the United States can often mean that, uh, that, that there's a challenge in trying to determine when the appropriate moment has come to move from espionage to actual kinetic forward action. So cyber warfare might be a little hard to define, but I can tell you this, 
Cyber war crimes are not hard to define. They are the same as every other war crime. They're the same as every other war crime because they intentionally direct attacks against civilian objectives, specifically objectives that are not military objectives. We're going to talk in a, in a moment about a couple of acts of war that are legally, as far as anyone's been able to tell me, acts of a war, uh, that are their war crimes. So cyber war crimes are not difficult to define. Under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, Article 7, which governs crimes against humanity, and Article 8, which governs war crimes, define very clearly what constitutes a crime against humanity and a war crime. And conducting inhumane acts of character intentionally causing great suffering or injury to body or mental or physical health is a crime against humanity. A war crime specifically targets civilian populations or against individual civilians not taking direct part in hostilities, especially places like historic monuments, hospitals, and places where the sick and wounded are collected, provided that they are not military objectives. This matters, and it matters because the United Kingdom has been the victim of a cyber war crime. Wanna Cry in 2017 was unhesitatingly a war crime com uh, committed by North Korean military hackers. And just because it was a sloppily conducted war crime, we'll talk more about my, my personal technical offense and how, <laughs> and how sloppy it was, doesn't mean that it wasn't intentionally directed against civilian objectives and spilled over into harming hospitals. So we know that war crimes exist and we already have the framework in place that specifically defines why it is that something that is done by a nation state, uh, an attack, a kinetic attack directed against a hospital is a war crime. And yet it's so difficult to get that agreement. Why is it difficult to get that agreement? Why is it difficult to do anything under NATO's Article 5? It's difficult because uh, Article, Article 5 requires unanimity. And flatly, unanimity is a difficult thing to come by in our current uh, we're not going to say quite post-Westphalian order, right? And as a result, we find ourselves in a world where we might just begin to ask ourselves, can't we just take all this stuff offline? Can't we stop making ourselves targets? Can't we move from a world where we don't understand what's happening to one where we do? Well, let's talk about that next. One of the questions I often get is, if I can't see this happening and I can't see anyone around me affected by it and I have no idea it's occurring and no one I know is being killed by it, is this real? Is it actually affecting me in any genuine way? I think what we have started to realize over the last more than a year now is that the actions of other people impact us far, far more than we really had processed as a world, as a global community. And the question of whether or not cyber warfare impacts individual people, it, it used to be a complex one. It used to be one where you had to answer it with statistics and probabilities. For the first time, especially over the last three and a half to four years, we can point to specific individual examples of human beings who have been physically, personally harmed by acts of cyber warfare. I'm going to talk a little bit in, uh, in, in this topic about what exactly constitutes the weapon that is a cyber weapon, how it's employed, how it's engaged, and who is impacted by it. This is the reason, again, that I'm here in the United Kingdom. It has to do with the fact that WannaCry in 2017 the, the interviews that I'm conducting here, the conversations I'm having with people, are telling me now that there is a deep and hidden wound from the beginnings of this form of warfare that has not yet been, come. it's not been something that we've processed as a globe, um, as people in the United States, as people in the UK, we haven't processed what it is yet. We haven't processed the fear and frustration that started in the middle of May, 2017. In 2017, when WannaCry, the ransomware attack that originated from North Korea, hit servers around the world 
uh, any server that had been, uh, any computer that had been unpatched and was running Windows 7 was uh, potentially vulnerable to this particular form of really awful ransomware. It shut down machines, it shut down hospital equipment, it harmed accounting firms, legal firms, stopped logistics from operating. WannaCry was a devastating attack. And if you don't really know yet how it impacted you, then we're still talking about statistics, but I can tell you that the NHS knows and remembers and the IT personnel that I've spoken to at the NHS who remember that day, they remember it like someone in the United States would remember where they were when Kennedy got shot or when they first heard on September 11th about the World Trade Center coming down. People in IT who did incident response that day remember where they were when they got the call in that same kind of way. It's starting to spill over into the the, the kind of, of trauma that you see people processing after de dealing with years of conflict zones. But what actually is the concept of a cyber weapon? How, how does it work? What are these things? What are they doing? When I say a ransomware attack, what do I mean by that? So a ransomware attack tries to get onto your computer and find a bunch of files and encrypt them and then ask you to pay to have your files decrypted. Interestingly, you never actually have your files usually in previous forms of this particular kind of attack, you usually didn't have your files stolen from you. Instead, you were denied the use of them. So what would happen is a, uh, a worm would get onto your computer, and we call it a worm when it's able to travel through computer systems and, and jump from system to system, as opposed to a virus, which can be carried by a worm, but a worm is more a form of transport, is how we kind of think about it in information security. So when this kind of attack happens. Um, you are denied the use of your files on your computer. And that could be trivial. It could be that you just bought it, there's nothing on it yet, or you could be someone who has a lifetime's worth of photos that you just digitized. And the most heartbreaking things that, that many of us heard that weren't related to human harm, or at least physical human harm, were people who lost the photos of their loved ones who had passed away, people who lost their small business records and couldn't pay their taxes that year. Th there's no doubt that WannaCry and the kinds of ransomware attacks that blossomed after the National, uh, the National Security Agency of the United States lost a trove of cyber weapons, there's no doubt that the human impact was real and devastating. And I, I, once you once you see that happen, it's not something that really goes away from you. And so it started to impact people in the real world. And so that's the beginnings of what these weapons do. But what does one actually look like? How do you do how do you hurt someone with a computer? So the first thing that you have to do is recognize that all of these things have to do with how computers work. They ask a question, and if it's answered one way, they do one thing. And if they if it's answered another way, they do another thing. The computers are simple. They're, they're simple, but they'll follow instructions perfectly. So when I talk about the two main cyber attacks that, that we kind of use now as examples of ways that people have gotten hurt, we talk about WannaCry and shortly thereafter, NotPetya. NotPetya was a Russian attack that was designed to attack Ukrainian accounting software in order to damage um, uh, the logistics and penetrate the networks of the Ukrainian government and you can read accounts of what this, this uh, worm did by far smarter people than me. Both of these things were styled, both WannaCry and NotPetya were styled as ransomware attacks. The truth is the, that NotPetya looked that way, but was a vicious and perfectly precise cyber weapon that then spilled over into shutting down 40% of the world's shipping in a matter of just a few weeks. Maersk, the, the, the global shipping conglomerate, lost billions of dollars. And Mondelay International, the food and logistics provider, has lost and tried to claim on insurance hundreds of millions of dollars in damages from food rotting in shipping containers around the world. There's no doubt that these, these kinds of attacks are impacting people. They're spilling into what we think of now as real life. But again, how do you do this with code? What are these things? So here are the two cyber weapons I'm going to show you today. This 
is the real deal. That's not Pecha. That shut down Maersk International and it took over Ukrainian servers spreading around the world uh, in, in a way that was that was done at the blink of an eye. It was a precise, clear, and, and demonstrable use of force. So when you look at this code right here, I want you to see how logical it is. It is a simple loop that goes and looks for a process, tries to figure out if that process is running. And if it is, it asks some questions. Has the file that's attached to what I'm looking at right now already been encrypted? If it has, skip to the next one. If it hasn't, try to encrypt it. See if it see if that'll work. Then it tries to encrypt it. You see the the up there, you'll see a little do if do and it jumps down. So, and what that's saying in that loop is, if this thing hasn't been done yet, try to do the thing. And if you can't do the thing, step to the next thing. As long as it's true that we're in this loop, that's the while down there. As long as this this condition is true, keep trying to do the thing. As soon as it stops being true and you've encrypted everything you can here, jump to the next moment, jump to the next place you can start doing this again. That is, as, as we would say, an elegant weapon from a more civilized age. It's, it's beautiful, it's precise, it's nation state level. Um, this isn't. This is what hit the NHS in 2017. That is WannaCry. It's a wreck. As, as a professional, I'm offended by looking at it. And this is what, frankly, probably got let out of a cage, possibly unintentionally. It, it's so bad, it might have been an accident. And yet there's, there's a saying that goes around, which is that most experts agree that the most likely way the world will be destroyed is by accident, right? So when you look at this code, I want you to see that it looks like a wreck. This doesn't look precise. This is stormtroopers falling all over themselves with no precision in anything they're doing. Do you see that function down there at the bottom? It says uh, local underscore six C and it leads to a specific function. That code, that comment right there, warning subroutine does not return. That was in the original code. And the original code that was being analyzed in the days of May 12th, 13th, 14th, 2017, turns out it was being analyzed in Devonshire by a young man named Marcus Hutchins who went by Malware Tech. Malware Tech, well, that was his finest hour. He registered the domain that made that subroutine return and stop infecting other computers. It means that what he did was found something that we call a kill switch. It's common for people to embed domain names in bad code. When I say bad code, and it's not just bad code, but, but malware as well to try to control it. It makes it so that if you need to, you can reach out as the original author of that code, flip a switch and stop it from operating anymore. It stops, it's the, the, the ticking button, the ticking timer that you see in, in movies on a bomb that's counting down and you find out where the, 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 to clip the wire that presumably only the person who built it knows where it's located. Well, it was, it was like it was hanging out there with a tag that said, cut me to stop this. And Marcus found it hit that kill switch, and there's your finest hour. Um, a young British man saved the world that day, and he stopped hospitals in the United Kingdom from shutting down. It was an extraordinary act, and it was it's probably the clearest act of cyber heroism we're going to see anytime soon. And it's a pleasure to know him, and this is, this is, this is on him. He found a way quickly to go through bad code and save you. This right here is mustard gas. It was indiscriminately released on a civilian population. The consequences are still there. And we're gonna talk more about how WannaCry has a long tail. It's still out there, all right? This, this kill switch is still operational. It's still stopping computers around the world from, from continuing to encrypt files that, are, that, that, that could be touching the original servers, the original uh, ransomware that was created that is called WannaCry. So we start to ask ourselves the question, if this is what's happening, if, if the world is complicated, if you can do this with code, if you could shut down shipping and harm hospitals, what on earth can we do about it? I'm gonna to start to answer that question in just a second. It doesn't matter who you are. 
there is always something that you can do about this to protect yourself, to learn more, no matter what your skill set is or where you find yourself. I don't care if you're a school teacher, a lawyer, the most brilliant hacker in the world, whether you're a politician or somebody who just likes sailing boats around the world. It doesn't matter who you are. There is still something that you can do about not only understanding, but beginning to start to prevent these kinds of actions of violence against a civilian population. So one of the things that we know about security is that no matter what, it is never, ever going to be perfect. We are never going to find a world where it's that there's no security gaps. It's just never going to be perfect, no matter what. And yet, one of the things we also know is that, although I've just told you that story about WannaCry and how devastating it was, locking up NHS hospitals, um, the kinds of cyber attacks that that stop global transportation, food supplies from making it to where they need to be, prescription medication from making it to the right locations. We also know that though the patch has been released for WannaCry, for the, the underlying flaw that made WannaCry possible, we also know that of the companies that were vulnerable to WannaCry in 2017, 26% of them still are. That means more than a quarter of the companies that knew about, found out about WannaCry and still have those same exact machines still haven't updated them. Why might they not have done that? Why might they not have updated those machines? For many people, they don't understand that the, the nature of updating a computer is something that needs to be constant in the background, automatic and always turned on. For others, they've deliberately chosen not to update their computers, specifically because they may be running things like critical infrastructure, which by itself is a terrifying conversation to have. If you are so dependent on a particular computer running for years at a time, you can't restart it, you can't change the, the software that's on it because it's running something as critical as water or power supply or an educational district. And the reason you can't restart it, a computer running Windows 7 is because you're so reliant on it for provision of services that you can't afford the time to repair it, is why we end up with these kinds of cyber attacks. I definitely encourage anybody who has the, the, the ear of the folks in IT to take a look at whether or not you're still running Windows 7. You can fix an extraordinary amount of the world simply by patching for this one vulnerability. We also know, no matter what, that everybody has constant ongoing incidents and vulnerabilities. There is no company, there's no organization, no government, no person who is 100% security flaw free. I, I'm not a great hacker. I'm a damn fine mediocre hacker. And I'm pretty good at making sure my own computers and situation is as secure as it can be. And yet I get hacked too. I don't just have my data stolen in the same kinds of attacks that you do, Equifax, or the kinds of breaches that, that governments let happen. For instance, the OPM hack in 2014 in the United States, or other data breaches that can become devastating, loss of email or address books like the Yahoo hack in the early 2000s. I'm pretty good at that, and I get hacked. There's no shame in it, right? There's no shame in the fact that people who are smart and targeting one person in, in particular, or even just statistically trying to grab the, the, the maximum number of victims they can, can find and harm you. We haven't stopped those impulses in humanity yet. And that is why, no matter what, there will always be ongoing security problems, flaws, and a reason to keep upgrading and patching. But that doesn't mean that we stop trying. It, it doesn't mean that we stop trying to make the world better. It just means we acknowledge our limitations and then start working within them to improve the situation we find ourselves in. And that 25 or 26% statistic right there, we could do better, folks. We could do a lot better on that one. These are still people running critical infrastructure that need to patch and improve and upgrade. So when we ask ourselves the question, what can we do about it, especially if we are IT professionals, if we're people who, uh, who speak to IT pros, I can tell you this right now. The single best defense against ransomware is impeccable planned and scheduled backups, off-site backups, because it turns out that when people have an incident, a ransomware incident, most of the time, the reason that that data is, is so valuable is because there's no backup for it. Anyone who has a full, complete, nightly backup of all of their data 
who experiences a ransomware attack gets to thumb their nose at whoever sent at, at whoever um, uh, engaged in this attack against them. Of course, people who have constant ongoing nightly backups and updates also usually have their patches rolling as well too. But this is a thing that you can do as an IT pro or as people who want to learn more about what IT pros do. You don't want data backup. You want restore. You want that ability to hit a button and restore your systems to a point in time. Plan for it or ask the people who can do it to plan for it. Think about the way that your organizations, your governments, your, your companies retain and secure their data. We have to think about the fact that data retention is something that is, it becomes a liability over time as well as a product of a lot of companies. And this is the stuff that, that international attackers go after. These are, these are the keys to the kingdom, customer data, financial information. That's what people are going after. And the way that we think about data and the value that it holds for us is also being thought about by the people who want to take it from us. Consider the idea that data restore might be an option for you as an IT professional or as someone who thinks about whether or not your organization is appropriately set up in the event of a disaster. I'm always happy to talk more with you about this, but this is the kind of thing that a smart professional is thinking about right now. And this is the defense in depth that makes attacks by nation states against companies, nonprofits, hospitals, governments, and individuals, communities, so difficult, especially if you've thought about this in advance. What can you do about it as a, as a policymaker, as someone who thinks about these problems on an everyday basis to try to keep other people safe? You don't, as I have a, I have a great friend and mentor who once said to me as I was busy rebuilding my computer for the sixth time that month, trying to get a driver to work, I was fascinated by this one thing and irritated by it. And he said, you're running a company now. You don't have time to do everyone else's job. Do your job and let other people do theirs. So this is the question I have for you as someone who needs to talk to people about how to do their job. Think about how you store your data. Think about what you're doing to protect yourself individually against these kinds of ransomware attacks. NHS hospitals, uh, uh, U.S. hospitals, shipping conglomerates, banking, legal, uh, legal firms, Governments everywhere have to start having these conversations about data retention, data architecture, and data security. And remember that sometimes the best choice in security to purge or to, to, to purge or delete or be able to audit and keep that data might be in direct conflict with things that we treasure, like privacy or the right to move freely without surveillance. These are tough choices and no one's pretending they're not. Don't give up on it as you're thinking about it. We went straight from, from these, these giant concepts, these global attacks, the, the, the big concepts of the Battle of, uh, of Salamis and the idea of missile defense and global cyber warfare to what you personally do in terms of data structure and choices. But that's because this is a war coming to a laptop near you. This isn't something that you can avoid as a subject or a topic any longer. And talking about how international conflict impacts you and your family and your government and your organization and your company is something that we're all gonna to have to start doing. Thinking about how you'll balance choices between being able to verify something or audit something versus protecting individual privacy and the rights of the user is, well, that's frankly the question we've all been asking ourselves in Silicon Valley, in the United States, in technology, in the global information security community for decades now. None of these are easy choices. Maybe use a little bit of a thought experiment. The next time you go to the doctor, ask your doctor, what happens to my data if I tell you I want it or I want you to delete it? And figure out, just ask yourself and then ask them, do you even know? Just remember that the things people are stealing, the things nation states are removing from you or taking from you uh, or denying your, your right to access is personal data as well as, as, well as international or strategic data. No matter what, all data is going to eventually become either deprecated or deleted away, or it will become fully public and in the hands of a foreign power. Nothing stays secret forever. It either loses its value or it becomes a part of the historic record. So which one do you want the data that you're protecting to be? These are the questions that are being asked by people at the Pentagon, at GCHQ. These are the kinds of questions everyone is starting to ask themselves because these kinds of conflicts, 
well, they're local now, or so global as to be indistinguishable from something that you see every day on the street. So what don't you know about the way the world is going to start working, not just today, but tomorrow? So we've talked about what constitutes this kind of warfare. We've talked about what makes up these cyber weapons, how they're being deployed, how they're being used, and just some of the questions you can ask yourself about how you keep yourself safe. There's no one perfect solution that applies to everyone, but you can use some of the questions I just gave you to ask not only yourself, but the people around you how to keep yourself safe and how to make smart choices to reduce your own attack surface in the event of the kinds of attacks that we're seeing increasingly dedicated towards people, companies, organizations. There's no border anymore for cyber warfare to be directed at. Nothing that stops someone from targeting you directly. And so these are some of the ways that you can ask these important questions, no matter who you are. Some of the ways you can frame these questions. So we know what's happening today, but what's about to happen tomorrow? Well, we have now gotten to a point where we have seen the very first AI-powered cyber attack. This was done in India at a bank where the usage of natural language processing, a phishing attack that was automated by use of a data breach and the information that was found within it uh, was massively successful. And we're already seeing the automation of these kinds of attacks in, in actual practice. So what's going to happen when they start becoming more and more common? We're going to see uh, a, an increasing flood of traffic that is illegitimate and yet difficult to both define and stop because these kinds of attacks look like every other email that you'll see. Paying attention to how information security professionals think about phishing attacks and personal safety will help. But the truth is, is we're now at a policy level again. We've now gotten back to the point where we're not asking questions anymore about what switches we flip as people, but how we think about either as policymakers or as people who want to speak to policymakers about what the world is going to look like. These are not acceptable numbers. These are not acceptable numbers because they start to they start to tell us that the companies that are protecting our data or protecting our data aren't doing the kind of job that they should be. These are solutions that happen at a policy level with regulatory frameworks that penalize companies for letting loose our personal data on the world because they can be used in cyber attacks against us. It's not appropriate for our companies to face little to no penalty for the kinds of negligence that lets the world be damaged on a permanent and ongoing basis. We're beginning now to see the kinds of attacks that are bearing fruit after seven to eight years of data leaks in Malaysia Airlines, in the Starwood breach from several years ago, and the kinds of attacks that are beginning to, to go after uh, high net worth traveler data. These are beginning to float around the internet now. Take a look and you'll see what I'm talking about. These these solutions are at a policy level. They're at the international level again. Think about and ask yourself whether or not it's appropriate for companies to face no penalty. Don't be that company. And if you're not that company, make sure that company faces a penalty for the kinds of, of negligence that hurts you and your family on an ongoing basis. We're already there. We're already at automated warfare. And yet, it's, it's a little frightening to think about how difficult it is sometimes to understand these concepts in cyber warfare, that they're happening, that they are impacting people, that there's no border, there's no fort that's stopping the, these kinds of attacks from rogue states uh, penetrating national borders and going straight after civilian targets. We know that these kinds of attacks are happening, and we know that they're going to continue to, to, to devastate us over time. And yet, we're not developing enough systems thinking. Enough of the kinds of thinkers and kinds of people that can solve these problems, partially because technology and information security still has a massive diversity problem. And when I say that, I don't just mean the color of someone's skin or their gender. I'm talking about the kinds of people who think about problems differently. We sometimes use diversity as a catch-all term for trying to make sure that we're, that we're uh, we're, we're seeing what we need to see. In reality, it's about thinking in new and interesting ways. The kinds of people who come up with these with, with ideas, not only to, to do horrific things in offense, but brilliant things in defense, 
They don't think the same as everyone else. Sponsor, mentor, educate, promote, fund, and train that diversity, that difference in thinking. And we're going to start to see a way to combat this kind of automated warfare. We're going to see a way to, to begin to combat the kinds of attacks that go after civilians. Find a way to think differently and be open to listening to people who are involved in the world and thinking about cyber warfare in different ways than you're thinking about it. We know this isn't going to get, it's not going to, it's not going to end, right? It's, this is not a situation that's going to stop. 100% of companies have ongoing incidents. 0% of security is ever perfect or is ever going to be. And this isn't going to end. This is, this isn't new in the way many people think about it. It's just the continuing story of conflict, fraud at the international level of harm against civilians and protection and militaries. These are stories that go back to Herodotus and, Thuc and Thucydides. They're not stories that are new in any way other than the fact that we're using a computer to conduct warfare. And so just remember that just as the story of humankind contains these stories of war and, and pain and fear, so also they do contain the stories of people who came up with ways to save the world, a kill switch, penicillin. The, the way that we save the world is by that same kind of, of new thinking that also helps us come up with the defenses against the kinds of attacks that are harming civilians. This is why I'm sitting here today, why I've, uh, I have, I want to say that I enjoyed talking with you today. The truth is, this is such a somber subject that I don't know if that's the right word. I'll tell you that I feel privileged to sit here today and, and speak with you about it and share ideas. I look forward, hopefully, to being able to, to speak with you as well uh, one day. And I'm going to give you my contact information in just a moment because it's a big topic but you're probably watching this alone. You're not alone. We're, we're out here. We're thinking about ways to solve these problems. And I want to hear from you. I want to know how I can refine my thinking and how we can make this world a better place. I look forward to speaking with you. I am, again, so profoundly honored and grateful that the US-UK Fulbright Commission asked me to be here, that Gresham College saw fit to introduce me so kindly and provide this platform. I am... I'm gratified and humbled, and we'll all keep thinking as hard as we can about this problem. And just as I know you're not alone, I know I'm not alone. We are, we're working together. We're trying to make it better. It'll happen. We can do it. It was a genuine pleasure. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.